I'm Kay Keith. I'm a baby internet man. I do music, game design, art, all that kind of stuff. Let's play. I'm Audie, and I'm 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is Joshin. Uh, I'm currently a BFA at the NYU Game Center, and also a member of the art group of Baby Castles, if anybody's from New York. <laughs> I guess that serves as a good mic check. You can hear all of us okay? Yeah, how's our audio? We good? Oh. I mean, we did like four checks. Yeah. Can we get the mics up a little bit? Is that cool? Test. Okay, well that. Hello? <laughs> well, we can talk right better? into them. Yeah. About. I can put it in my mouth. <laughs> I, I can handle this. All right, is, this, is this audible? Yeah. All right. Is better? this good? All right, cool. All right. All right, so just a brief overview of what we're going to do today. This is like a half academic panel, but it's mostly just an excuse for us to show you some funny game jokes. Uh, so we're going to take a look at what we think makes humor in games unique, what we think uh, the sort of specific elements are uh, that are afforded by games that allow for sort of unique uh, infusions of humor. Um, we've got a couple of categories. They're really loose. They're really just there to provide us a heuristic through which we can show you some stupid jokes. Uh, and then, you know, at the end we're going to do some honorable mentions, some stuff that didn't really fit in the presentation. <laughs> we're going <laughs> to... We're going to throw in some stuff that you should check out and then at the end we'll do QA discussion type stuff and we're going to have a game to give away some sweet, slick prizes. So even if this panel sucks, stick around because we got some good ass goofs for you. I, I like freaked out when I saw what all was brought. They're good goofs. Uh, so for the interest of academic purity, we do have a thesis slide. This is it. Uh, this is basically the interactive nature of games makes them a unique medium for engaging with the viewer with all sorts of emotion and humor definitely falls under that category right. when you're really immersed in a setting and you're like sort of physically reinforced to follow its rules of that unexpected jolt that results in a humorous environment is intensified. Mm. And uh, to better explain that we really need to define jokes so jokes are the earliest form of human, uh, human communication. Um, basically how we're defining jokes and more loosely comedy is you have some sort of setup and expectation and uh, then some absurd element is added and it's in a way that's non-threatening to the, to the audience and the audience and joke teller can enjoy positive emotion from this like rush of knowing hidden information between the two of them. Right. I think that's, uh, I'm not too good on the philosophy slash psychology, but. This is a comedy panel. We don't got to get into the deep stuff. Uh, so the really, the two bit, the big thing that we think sets games apart is honestly the interactive element. With traditional media, uh, humor is often passive. You're normally just a member of the audience and jokes are sort of being thrown at you by a third party. Be it in theater, be it in television, in literature. You're intaking comedy but you're not having a direct interactive or like any sort of haptic uh, impact on the joke itself. Whereas in games, yeah. whereas in games, uh, the interactive element is pretty much key. You as the player are interacting with the environment and without you turning on the game and actually sitting down and playing it and progressing through it, any of the jokes that developers put in, any of the jokes that you yourself can just bring out of the mechanics, or any un unintentional jokes like glitches or anything like that can't happen. The player is an integral part of the comedic process of a game unfolding. So you not only witness humor like you do in other forms of media, you're not only a passive observer like you are with Chaniki, where everything is just kind of being thrown at you, but you also directly engage with mechanics to uh, result in humorous scenarios. And the most interesting thing that I find is that the games also interact with you, the mechanics interact with you, <laughs> to sort of screw you over and make comedy themselves. So the four broad categories that we're going to be covering today are uh, passive humor, uh, which is uh, just humor that's plainly delivered that uh, could be facilitated uh, and exist in traditional media, uh, active humor, which requires the player to uh, be included in on the joke, and then emergent humor, that emerges through the community uh, in conjunction with the game. And then uh, lastly we'll have uh, humor that is unintended, un unintendedly emerging from the system itself. Right. All right, so to start off with uh, the jokes for the audience category, these are um, goofs that we think would work in other forms of media but have a certain element that's enhanced by being in an interactive media. 
And so the rough categories for that are going to be physical gags, situational absurdity, and dramatic irony, if you want to try to very loosely describe them. There's a lot of overlap. This right. They're really just here to serve some kind of a basic, you know, categorical heuristic for us. So this type of humor is most similar to that in the rich artistic tradition and other forms of media, where in essence the absurdity of a situation or behavior it, completely curated by the writers or designers, joketicians, is largely passive audiovisuals that all audience members participate in equally. Whenever anyone watches Friends, uh, everyone hears the upbeat theme song and sees these otherwise upstanding young adults callously gallivanting around in a fountain. Nearly all people watching the show will be familiar with the social contract preventing civilians from entering public waterworks and the visceral, <laughs> and the visceral horror of getting drenched in clothes. The cast's unfaltering, pleasant, and handsome demeanor delivers delicious contrast to this mind-rending criminal behavior. And everyone who is watching Friends is equally engaged in a joke they had no part in and are forced to laugh. And that's sort of how these jokes are like to. Right. Uh, so we're going to start off with slapstick, cell damage, uh, classic game of my childhood. <laughs> uh, so pretty clearly this is... Looney Tunesian trying to evoke that kind of just nonsensical, violent sort of cartoon humor. Um, but similar to Choaniki, there's no inherent, um, no mechanical tie to that. There's nothing funnier about what you're doing to like swing the giant mallet or buzz saw someone in half than there right. is from shooting a shell in Mario Kart. It's not the feedback that's so important, it's more or less just the visuals. And similarly passive, a uh, pretty well-known example of companion cube from Portal. Uh, for those of you somehow not familiar with this, up to this point in the game, you've solved plenty of puzzles with these weighted cubes, put them on buttons, carry them around with you. And all of a sudden, almost like well over halfway into the game, there's all this to do about one random cube that uh, is constantly be talk being talked up by the narrator GLaDOS and apparently only differs from a regular cube in that it has this little heart on it and unlike the other cubes which are left in the solved puzzle state you have to incinerate it at the end so in a way this is sort of like tragedy in games but uh, <laughs> it's like if you had to kill uh, your date after a really good first date yeah so yeah, I mean, and it, it, it's sort of, it's comparable in this sense to uh, elements of traditional media because this is really just, uh, it, it's like uh, Wilson in Castaway. It's just sort of an embodied physical object that's anthropomorphized and given some kind of a semblance of a personality. So it's a joke that works and is used in other forms of media. Uh, and it's, it's also, you know, it's also feasible in games, this sort of humor. Right, and I would assert that uh, by being in a game, it's slightly more effective in that not only do you get to see that this is an ordinary cube, you can like test it, you could hack it and put it in other places. There's no dialogue that comes from the cube unless I missed some part of the right. plot. Right. You're not, you're not only witnessing Tom Hanks losing Wilson, you are directly losing Wilson. Mm -hmm. And it is played in less depressing uh, examples in traditional media like Plank from Ed and Eddie's. Right, right. Uh, and now sort of the hardest to exactly define is the meta humor. Uh, this is a joke from Undertale that's sort of unique among jokes in that game. So at this point in the game, if you haven't played it before, the game has established that it has a lot of weird monster designs all depicted in battle with these black and white simplified sprites. This one's called Shiren, so it's a siren, mermaid looking thing looking over its shoulder at you with a buff arm being the Undertale twist, but uh, if you happen to be playing a run where you were fighting this character, which I assume most players wouldn't be doing, oops, doesn't need to be. Uh, so, if you win the fight here, which is not what the game encourages, you actually get to see this finished sprite of what is a weird sea slug with big lips. That was actually what she was floating above uh, in her original form. And that kind of like visual unclear, unclear situation could work in other media, like if you've ever seen a duck or a rabbit uh, optical illusion based on how you're trying to interpret it. But uh, I feel that being in an RPG like this had a really good setup for it in that 
you don't see the um, enemy in the overworld. It's just a random encounter that shows up just in battle and you get that one pose of it. Right. And then um, basically you have to find out post-game exactly what's going on with that character. Mm -hmm. All right, so moving into, uh, moving out of sort of the passive comedy into the active comedy, which is what we feel games sort of work best with. Um, we feel it's important to sort of uh, just again clarify the difference between the audience and the player, whereas with the audience you're just sort of passively intaking humor. The player directly influences the humor. You're directly interacting with it in a way that sort of results in a haptic feedback. Without you, the jokes just can't happen. Yeah, so like when you and your friend both TiVo Seinfeld and are catching up on it, you don't have to ask, oh, did you, did you manage to get the quick time event during the stand-up bit? Because if you do, then George gets promoted to marine biologist and he doesn't have to die. Uh, but as it is, there's only one way to interpret, or only one way to view an episode. Right. Thinking about things is definitely somewhat interactive. But that's, a little, <laughs> that's a whole other ball game. Yeah, so the rough categories we've separated this category into are interactive gags, mechanical disconnect, and then just very broadly subverting expectations. Right. So to just offer a brief example of uh, this kind of gag, yeah, yeah okay, I can see someone recognizes this already. This kind of gag, uh, it would, this kind of gag works in other media. This is a passive example of a gag that we're gonna show you an interactive uh, version of. So this is just a famous Japanese prank. It's like a big flash mob. A lot of, a lot of other places have done this. Um, this guy walking down the street, he's an innocent bystander, so it's not as though he has any real active or interactive relevance to this bit. The bit's gonna happen either way. It doesn't matter if it's him walking down the street or someone else. <laughs> Anybody who walks down this alley is gonna get stormed at by this crowd of like dozens of people. Um, and, but an example, of, an example of this kind of bit that works in, in games and that's interactive is the Kukos from Legend of Zelda. I'm sure everyone's familiar, but for those who aren't, uh, in Zelda, the only enemies that you can really influence are, well, enemies. NPCs, you can't attack, you can talk to them. Um, but there's these passive creatures called Kukos. They're basically just chickens. And they're one of the few things in the game that you can attack that's not going to fight back with you. Well, you know, at least not at first. Uh, if you, for whatever reason, sadistically just go, go after these Kukos, they're going to get their vengeance upon you. And at the end of the day, when you take this kind of a bit and you take the flash mob bit, they're really doing the same exact thing. They're both this kind of slapsticky bit where you're just bombarded by elements out of nowhere that you weren't expecting. Except in this case, you're not just a guy walking down the street and it's happening to you. You're bringing this upon yourself. Without you doing this thing, without you fighting these kukos, nothing's going to happen. This bit just doesn't come up. So the interactive element here is totally key for this joke occurring. And this has just been a hallmark bit in Zelda games. It's in all of them. It's in Hyrule Warriors. It's in basically every Zelda game. So it's just become sort of a famous slapstick routine at this point. Uh, it, it's not in the CDI games. Well, <laughs> nothing's really in the CDI games at the end of the day. Uh, so yeah, another, another example of a slapstick kind of thing is in Metal Gear Solid 3. I mean, Kojima's famous for this. Metal Gear is famous for these kinds of things. But if for whatever reason in Metal Gear you open up the menu and you decide to look at your model here, you might realize you can spin this guy around. Uh, and some people will think, okay, let me just do this for a while, because why not? Uh, so yeah, what You're supposed to use this feature to look at his butt. This is the Yeah, it's pretty much just for the eye wishes. candy. Uh, but I, Kojima thought, okay, well, if someone's going to do this, what would happen if you did this to someone in real life? And of course, <laughs> it's going to make you sick. So again, it's just, it's a, it's a basic sort of slapstick gag that it's not gonna happen unless you're there doing this weird thing for no reason, interacting with the game in this very unique and specific way. So without the player there interacting with the game in this form, this bit just can't really happen. It can be shown to you, but there's this added element of humor when you sort of bring it upon yourself and you realize, oh shit, I just did that. Now, both of those slapstick examples aren't like guaranteed things that someone playing the game as intended are going to see. Uh, for narrative, uh, that's when this sort of humor is used to engage the player and sort of do world building at the same time with the humor. So, in the event you can't completely hear this clip or aren't familiar with it, basically your character is just woken up at, from a coma. This is the start of the game and where most games would have a tutorial with what different buttons do. It says space to say Apple and speak. 
and uh, it sort of plays off of being a sequel in this sense because if you've played Portal 1 or really any game on the engine, you know that space is not going to make you speak or say Apple, it's going to make you jump, and that's what happens, and that affects where the direction of the story goes because this character who hasn't really established themselves as crazy or anything yet uh, sees you unable to speak and jumping to very specific easy commands. Another example of this from the recent Pokemon games is uh, the Fire Trial, so this is minor spoilers if people are uh, worried about that sort of thing. But basically in the new games they replaced the gyms where they typically had archetypical video game sort of Zelda E challenges or trivia mm -hmm. uh, with more freeform trials sort of punctuated with Pokemon battles. So for this one, it's a pretty standard spot the differences. These Marowaks do two different dances and you have to guess which one was different. Right. So let me actually pause it here and explain the way they have it. So we skip the battle, but uh, if you pick the correct one, it says, oh, you got it right. Now you can battle them. And if you get it wrong, it says, oh, you messed up. Now you have to battle them. <laughs> <laughs> And so after that battle, it's like, all right, well, that was round one. Good job. Let's get going with round two. So see if you can spot the difference here. Yeah. All right, you guys ready? It's a little shorter, but the difference in the dance is a lot more subtle. <laughs> did, you, did you catch it? <laughs> so, How? so now nobody really knows exactly what to expect. So keep in mind this is the before, so... All right, so here's, right. here's the before. Good game design, introduce your elements, uh, process them one at a time, now test them on both of them at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> the, the best part about this, this here is that all of these answers are yes. <laughs> You can't actually answer this question wrong. You can, sh you can see it again as many times as you want, but it's just all yes. So they're basically just start off with a challenge and then just kind of go, eh, never mind. <laughs> and uh, this not only provides a funny scene out of context, but provides a bit of characterization for the character who set this up, which is a theme with a few of them. The right, right. And then finally, in terms of more objectively meta humor, uh, we have an example from an indie adventure game, Ben There, Dan That. So this game is sort of a satirical, uh, self-referential celebration of classic adventure games. Um, it's sort of the epitome of meta. Yeah, so the situation here is that you need the cross just to use as an arbitrary key to get to the next part of the game, and uh, the priest doesn't want to give up the cross because it's his last symbol of Christianity. So. Uh, you move your characters upstairs in the church, and you find the Bible. And using adventure game logic, your cursor is the Bible. You can use it on things, so you give it to the priest. And instead of handing him the Bible, like you think you're going to, boop! <laughs> so yeah, that joke really requires uh, advanced knowledge of adventure game tropes to make sense, but it... Uh, keeps you fooled right up to the end. There's a really good video I'm gonna plug at the end that analyzes this really effectively. This is a much deeper bit than it actually seems, so. Uh, and then our final category is emergent humor or jokes that sort of aren't necessarily made for the community or, or by, by the, the community. community, but are very dependent on them. So the main difference between this and the active category, because both require audience participation, is that it assumes not just an engaged viewer, but multiple viewers and the developers aware of the other parties and interested in active collaboration. Right. So although I wasn't able to actually think of any great examples of that in a humor context in traditional media, uh, community-driven media is still present in traditional media. So like Survivor at the time was pretty novel for having the characters, I think, I don't know, maybe a better reality TV buff knows if there's a more suitable example. Zero, but basically not scripting the episodes I think was novel at the time. And in a more analogous to like a large fandom example, um, American Idol has the entire audience vote on uh, their favorite songs. 
So to continue this sort of sitcom analogy we have going, it would be like if whenever you watch the Big Bang Theory, NBC got your vitals and was able to like measure your active engagement and then optimize the show to keep you laughing as much as possible. So that would of course result in a perfect Shellman only challenge run. <laughs> Uh, the categories here are absurd gamification, what we decided to keep as goofs framing, which mm. is sort of just making an absurd alternate narrative um, or altering the existing narrative, and then what we have called conceptual subterfuge, and I'm not going to explain. <laughs> so remember when you were 12 years old and argued at the lunch table about whether Ronald McDonald could fight, could beat Akuma in a from Street Fighter in a fight? Well, that's basically what Mugen, a fighting game engine that lets players create their own characters, movesets, and assets. It allows everybody to finally see this uh, dream come true. Right. SaltyBet is a site with an embedded 24-hour Twitch stream that pits different AI-controlled characters from the Mugen community uh, database against each other, allowing us to Bet using fake currency. <laughs> the humor comes from the endless number of different wacky characters, as well as the often overpowered movesets that you'll see if you tune in. This kind of speaks for itself in a lot of ways. <laughs> the, this, what you're seeing right now, it's a game engine that was created, but the characters you're seeing fight are only possible to exist on the screen here because of the community. These are community-made characters that are duking it out. I mean, you can tell that because they're so completely over the top. The whole, the whole deal with Mugen and with Salty Bed is that pretty much every character in this game can just be whatever you want. So nobody has any reason not to make 30 Gokus that can all kill you in a single punch. Uh, so it's a really interesting example of a game that, without a community they're representing in producing content as well as intaking content, none of the humor in it would be possible, and the game itself wouldn't really be possible. Very intertextual, to say the least. I'm really sort of surprised this video doesn't have Peter Griffin in it somewhere. <laughs> That's what most movie videos I had seen for a while were. All right, so I think that... Yeah, that, that, that's across. enough of that. <laughs> So uh, a more recent example of uh, the way that in which that com communal and emergent humor can sort of impact a narrative uh, is D.Va from Overwatch. I mean, for anybody who's not familiar with Overwatch, it's Blizzard's sort of most recent FPS MOBA type game. And this one character, D.Va, is a pro gamer from South Korea who, uh, upon the game's release, the community kind of developed their own humorous narrative around her where uh, everyone's familiar with the whole Doritos, Mountain Dew, quote unquote, gamer grub nonsense. Um, people sort of started depicting her as this kind of like cutesy, spoiled type gamer, gamer person who scarfs down Doritos and chugs Mountain Dew and it just sort of became like this jokey element surrounding her character. So it's just like a communal bit, you know. Um, but eventually, Blizzard sort of embraced this and thought, what if we sort of write this into the game? So they started throwing in little Easter eggs like these Doritos in this, in this one victory pose. And then they've embraced it further uh, with this sort of idle animation for her where if you can, yeah, get that going. She uh, sort of crouches down and is playing this projected video game. And if you look on either side of her, uh, on her left she's got a can of soda, and on her right she's got a bag of chips. So this is one really interesting thing that games can do that other forms of media can only really do in sequels, which is they can sort of iterate their own content. They can update and they can change. And this is a really cool example of this joke that just came about from the community actually being taken and embraced by the developers and being written into the sort of mythos of the game. So it just goes to show that these, this type of humor it can really only come about from this communal backing. So Moonbase Alpha is a space simulator game funded and published by NASA, so you can already tell it's going to be a very, very serious game. Right. <laughs> its intent was to show off their lunar design as well as spark interest in STEM, which I guess you can argue it did anyway. Uh, while the actual gameplay is about astronauts on the moon repairing uh, space stations, the community utilized a text-to-speech option in the menu that altered the way that you play the game. Right. So they kind of decided at the end of the day that uh, this was the proper way to play this. And we'll just let this sort of uh, speak for itself. And 
this is them playing the game more or less as intended. I mean, this is just a feature within it. They're not abusing any scripts or anything like that. Nothing third party. This is just a basic mechanic of this game lets you do this. So this is one of my favorite examples, and this is kind of a weird one. I'm gonna try to keep this short because I can talk about Dark Souls for hours and hours and hours and hours. Um, but Dark Souls, it's basically just this dark fantasy epic where there's a lot of um, sort of clandestine information and you're left to figure out a lot of the mechanics of the game on your own, but everything sort of serves a purpose. Everything has some kind of meaning behind it. So when you're making your character, you can pick uh, an item from this list of different beneficial items that they, you can either like buff your weapon early or get uh, these Molotov cocktails that can help out in combat. But one of the items you can get is this pendant that says it has no effect. And the developer of the game, Miyazaki, actually recommended people choose this or choose nothing. So right off the bat, the lead developer is saying, you should just take this. And he wouldn't say why. In follow-ups, to people asking him, what do you mean? He said, I'm so sorry, just try this thing out, try to figure out for yourself what this thing does. Um, so in the, uh, in the year following this game's release, the hardcore community just like did everything they could to figure out what this thing does. They just put it in their pockets and went and hit every single wall in the game to see if having it would make any of them like illusory and have treasure behind them or something. Talking to every single NPC in the game with this pendant. Just trying to do everything they possibly could to figure out what it does until about a year in when they released the first DLC, he finally came out and said, uh, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> you see, <laughs> the, Dark Souls is a game that's designed around it having a community. Like I said, a lot of the information in it is kind of hard to parse. You're left to figure out a lot of things on your own, and it was designed that way because Miyazaki wanted people to go online and talk to each other about it and sort of get together to figure things out on their own. So he figured, if they're all gonna be trying to figure all these puzzles out and they're gonna be collaborating, what if I just throw in this little prank that means nothing and see if they just eat, eat at it for years? So in a way, it's this genius, like, way for a developer to play a prank on the community that I don't, I've never really seen happen in other forms of media and I think it's really clever and it's a really good example of the ways in which games and communities surrounding the games can throw out these really unique bits. It's really cool. Yeah, and uh, honorable mention from the same game, similar idea is uh, the hint system. A lot of players like to uh, write basically fake hints insinuating like you should try to drop go walk off this ledge and, there's treasure down there or, uh, try to um like hit a fake wall and get it oh, crap what? oh my fucking god all right let's that still sinks that's good um. sorry hold on Wow, what a completely unintended way to segue into talking about glitches. Um, I think it's, it's difficult to leave glitches and bugs out of the conversation when we're talking about the complex engineering feats that are in fact video games. Fundamentally, glitches and bugs are blemishes, what designers aim to eventually erase in their perfect world. It becomes interesting in a way that humor can redeem glitches, where me messy and unexpected things suddenly become incredibly positive and productive. While a lot of comedy gets thrown out the window when, in, in games when player interactivity and agency are, are mixed together, glitches use this to its, its advantage. Mm. It's, it exists almost as like the perfect non sequitur, the system that allows you to consume the joke that accidentally serves <laughs> Skate's kind of the perfect example of this. It has such a, a rich physics system that it just creates these <laughs> incredibly unique glitches. It's a seven minute video, so you can pull this up on your own, but. You yeah. more compilations to go with that. Right. So this is kind of a bittersweet one.
Did you want to cover this? You want me to grab it? Uh, it kind of speaks for itself in a way. <laughs> I, I can only say Sean. Sean. Like this there's is sort of good contrast to the skate video because that was the like very convoluted physics systems sort of chaotically unfolding. This is just like a single missed flag to turn off that quick time event <laughs> and it pretty dramatically alters the way the seed unfolds. It's weird because it's traumatic and in a way it kind of makes sense for him to be screaming here. Uh, but it goes on. <laughs> So we'll just let that kind of play out for a minute so you can see what we mean here. <laughs> All right. Oh, I like it. So we, we can't leave esports out of this. <laughs> so what's really interesting about uh, this glitch, or I guess bug, since uh, Valve eventually patched this out, um, is that um, it's a completely legitimate tactic, but it, it, it also requires an extreme amount of skill. This is the international in 2013. For those of you who don't know, it's the highest level of play that you can get at Dota 2. Um, and this was a, a legitimate strategy that allowed them to win the game. Um, and it unfolded when uh, the hero Chen, which has this ability that allows him to teleport uh, another allied uh, hero, in combination with uh, Pudge, which has a hook. Um, he's, a, he's a little boy and he, he hooks people in and that kind of amalgamation of mechanics allows this really funny glitch to come into play. All it's doing is bringing that other hero back to Pudge's model, and it's just not where it was. <laughs> so that's all the examples we're going to go into real juicy detail for right mm. now. But uh, like Some honorable uh, mentions to cover anyway. Yep. Uh, so Default Dan, that's an indie title. I know it's been here the last few years. Um, it's sort of like a reverse Mario sort of situation where everything that looks good is bad for you and vice versa. And that would be playing off a lot of slapstick and meta humor based if, on your expectations. If you're someone who boots up a platformer and goes to grab a coin, don't do that in default end. It'll kill you. <laughs> uh, Sonic 2006 is just like terribly glitchy and has a lot of probably unintended narrative humor. Uh, I Pro wanna probably unintended? I want to assume most people are roughly familiar with that. Look it up if you haven't seen it. Uh, Twitch plays Pokemon, the community event where they streamed Pokemon over the streaming service Twitch and then took the chat's inputs as what was fed into the emulator. Uh, again, a lot of these are pretty well known, which is why they're honorable mentions. We wanted to not just tell you the stuff you already knew about the entire time. Uh, Leroy Jenkins, uh, turns out in MMOs, if you have Mike you can scream at other people and be weird. Um, <laughs> Pokemon Quartz and Marble are just these really strange uh, Pokemon ROM hacks by, I think he's a Spanish guy who goes by Baro. Um, there's, not, there's not much I can even say about them. Just check them out. They're really, very, they're really, really weird. And then Rhythm Heaven and WarioWare are probably more the passive category where it's just uh, amusing aesthetic and delivered really well. Right. I would also like to mention Deadly Premonition. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Swery 65 and Deadly Premonition. I'll tell that at the end. That could be a discussion thing. Okay. If you want to hear a story about Swery 65, someone ask me that at the end. So you have a reason to stick around for Q&A. Anyway, here's our credits. If you want to know a specific video, let us know after Q&A. We won't get those for you. Uh, if you recommend it, um, like, Fan Version or Monster Factory and Carboys, um, which are based around, like, which is an unintended effects of uh, character creators and soft body simulation games. Uh, uh, Story Beats by Innuendo Studios was the thing I kind of ripped off of for the Ben There Dan That example and was pretty influential to my rough attempts at like making academic um, framing for a panel that's just showing funny videos. <laughs> Tari, do you want to cover the Tari thing? Uh, 
Tariel is just, uh, it's, it's another reason to play Morrowind, which is already a good game, but uh, it's a really funny um, joke that just comes in as soon as you like enter the game or you leave the starting town. Right. All right, so uh, we're going to just jump into this game here if anybody wants to play along. So we tried to come up with some of the most overused, overquoted jokes or lines from games. Um, so they're kind of hidden. We've given you the title that they appear in. Some of them should just scream out at you. Uh, okay. So right off the bat, you want to come up and claim a prize, Hotshot? Oh God, this is way more. We're gonna have to have some kind of structure to this. We're gonna have some kind of structure to this because there's prizes. So we gotta be fair. You'll have to come up into a mic so that you can get a prize. Okay, we can have people screaming them out, but you did scream that out first, so you come up here. Phoenix Wright, man. Someone said something about a purple light. Yeah, you come up too. <laughs> All right, but you wanna get that mic ready just in case? This is the kind of thing, like, we're just gonna do this free form. If you have questions or if you wanna just come up and uh, talk about a funny, a funny joke that you think people should check out, if that's you, totally cool. If you think you know one of these, come up. Uh, we could have two separate lines, like, uh, okay. Uh, then just come up and talk. It doesn't, it doesn't even really matter. So you. Some of these gifts are great, and some of them are average, and some of them are bad. So here's uh, volume two of the official Facebook. Miles under files. No problem. And for you, since you're so eager about Castlevania, here's some fucking garlic. You're welcome. All right. We'll form a line over here, if that's cool. All right, so you, you have uh, Duke Nukem 3D up here, and I'm guessing you're going for, uh, I'm here to kick ass and chew bubble gum and I'm all out of gum. Do you, want, do you want me to tell you if you're right? I, I mean, wait, because my favorite is, uh, from that is, uh, I had breakfast with your mom this morning, or I had breakfast this morning, I had eggs, your mom had sausage. <laughs> That's my favorite of them. Classic dude. Did you say you were out of gum? It's out uh, of gum. Yeah, well, there's some gum for you, buddy. A nice refill for you. One more. Just in case. You want to click these off as we go? Oh, okay, cool. The, the cake, what you got? The cake is a lie. I'm sorry? The, the cake is a lie. Guess what? Guess what? Could you say that one more time for us? The cake is a lie. Go, hey. The, come, come over here. Come over here. The cake is a lie. Guess, guess what? Guess what, motherfucker? Yes! Yes! Not anymore, it's not. We we were originally gonna have like a full Matilda bit where you would have to eat that entire thing up here and just sit up here quietly <laughs> with us, but there's a there's an extra joke inside the box committee. written on the cake. That's a secret joke just for you, pal. How's it going, man? What you got? Hello? Uh, Hello. I'm going to go with uh, someone set us up a bomb. You're getting there. You're getting there. I think we'll give it to you, though. Can you give me one more from that? Um. Baseball. 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 I got some bases for you, buddy. <laughs> now all of them do belong to you. Now I'm, I'm making an exception today, but it is normally my policy to wear shorts year-round. I just, I like shorts. They're comfy and they're easy to wear. Shorts are comfy. Is that all? No. Wait, are, you're not wearing shorts. I think I have to give it to you anyway because the shorts joke is a pretty good joke. This one is kind of one of the grab bag type gifts. It's basically just a bag full of plushes. Do you want me to give you the bag or should I just dump them all on the floor? Whatever feels good, man. Whatever. Oh, it's that, it's that other Pokemon. Oh, that's one of the new ones. Oh, yeah. None of them are wearing shorts either, I don't <laughs> Thank you, man. joke, you spoony bard. Oh! That's it. Come over here. Come over here. You, you have a, this is a special one. You get a choice. Charles, by the way. You get a choice between two gifts, okay? 
See, see your choices matter. All right. You can pick either. We've got two. We've got two really nice gifts here. You can pick either a mint, complete in box, box of spoons, <laughs> or a near mint. Well, that's actually kind of like good condition, I guess. Com oh, but complete in box, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance. I'll make an exception. Nothing venture, nothing gain. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hold up, hold up, hold up. I was going to do the fun. Ah, How you doing? I'm doing pretty well. You want some water? You good? You parched? I like your I like your hoodie, man. Nice shirt. You a Mass Effect fan? Yeah. What's your name? Steve. Can I have a handshake? <laughs> nice to meet you, dude. You're a good sport. Now I gotta, I'm gonna have to think for a minute about what to do. Uh, before I do that, though, I think I need to uh, construct some additional pylons. Oh, I'll, I'll, I have something you can construct. Here you go. It's not related at all to your sweatshirt. <laughs> construct those Legos real nice, buddy. <laughs> How's it going, man? How's it going? Pretty good. How about you? Uh, actually, I did want to bring up another comedy scene that I really uh, enjoyed to well, Yeah, go ahead. Um, Fill us in. Uh, have you played Tales of the Borderlands at all? Or Tales of the Telltale game? I've played the first two Borderlands. I haven't gotten to Tales yet. Okay, uh, there's, there's a joke in there. You know how you see in like, a corporate environment, like people in a corporate environment do this? Yeah, yeah. The bing! Yeah, like, that, that's a running thing in the game. And like, there's a scene where a bunch of the characters are trying to escape from there. Mm -hmm. Not to get too much into spoilers, but there's an entire section in the Telltale games are very quick time heavy, um, where it has an entire there's a confrontation. You think they're gonna pull out the guns and take them. Things but are gonna then, get serious. But then the entire scene is them doing a gunfight entirely with fingers. Oh and, yeah yeah. And everybody from the ship is like shooting at each other and getting bazookas. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I just played that very recently. It was just one of the funniest scenes I've ever That's a really good bit. There was also, there was a, I think it was a 360 commercial back when the 360 came out. I of uh, people in like a Port Authority or something and they all start shooting each other with the figure guns. Yeah. It's, a, it's a good bit. That's a nice bit. I, I, I bring it up when I took an arrow to the knee. You did take an arrow to the knee. Let me help patch you up, pal. Here, you can, you can get yourself nice and fixed up with this. Sweet. It should have everything. I mean, it's got Neosporin. It's got some Motrin, that should help with the pain. You might have to apply a few of those band-aids, they're kind of small, but that'll help you out. Of course. How's it going? Pretty good. Um, I have to get a good voice for this. Uh-huh. Um, hey, listen! <laughs> I I'm listening. Uh, you have to go to Lake Island. Do you want to warp there? I don't have the means yet. Oh, I'll help you out. Some fucking hero of time, you don't have the Ocarina yet. <laughs> now you do. Congratulations, you won. How's it going, man? Going pretty good. Welcome to the front of the room. How you doing? Yeah, the mics are kind of messy. It's oh, all okay. good. I wasn't sure about that. Well, I, I wanted to ask you guys if you guys can just like lay on the floor for a sec. Uh huh. And then kind of just do a barrel roll. We, we can. That'd be great. That'd be great. Can you, can you do it first? I'll do it with you. If we, can we both do that right now? That sounds fair. That sounds fair. You probably deserve better for this, so I'm sorry. This is kind of a sadistic gift, but Star Fox Adventures on the GameCube. <laughs> How's it going? 
good. Got your mic there. You all set? Nice shirt, man. I am. Thank you. Come at me, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Flaunt it. You ready? Uh-huh. Snake. Snake. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Snake. Snake. No, we, yeah, we hear you. You... <laughs> I mean, I know another one if you want another one instead. Uh, do you like, you like snakes? I do. I like snakes. Here, let me help you out. He's got you. Some Haribo rattlesnakes for the snake fan. <laughs> Badoop boop. How's it going? Good. Welcome um, to the front of the room. Hello, hello. Hi. Hi. I don't really have a funny bit. That's fine. But your princess is in another castle. Which one? Another one. Uh, uh, this is like... I don't have a princess. My girlfriend's sitting right there. She's not Peach, so... Oh, wait, is she the wrong one? Eh, uh, that's fair. Do you have children? Are you, are you a mother? Well, guess what? I, I have a friend here who's a mother, and if ever, if ever you're interested in having children, you can consult my friend here. Uh, his name's Luigi. You can call him Mama Luigi. <laughs> Super Mario World DVD. That's also a sadistic gift at the end of the day, so I'm sorry, but eh. <laughs> You're welcome. We only have one left? I think people know Yeah, this one's kind of obvious. Does anybody want to just freeform guess a Sonic the Hedgehog joke? Like. The first person to come to the front of the room and say it gets the gift. <laughs> Have some faith in yourself. We're sitting on a panel. We're nervous too. Yeah, come here. How's it going? Rolling around at the speed of sound. That's good enough. That's from an, that's from an, well, I mean, some people will tell you it's good. Some people will tell you it's bad. I'll probably tell you it's both. I'll, I'll take it though. This is kind of the final sadistic gift, so again, I'm sorry, but Sonic 06. <laughs> it's a beat up, dirty copy. Hope you like it. It's a very smart game. That's really all we got, folks. I hope that was fun. Thank you very much.